Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Wednesday morning Bible study of the Shiloh Baptist Church of Plainfield, New Jersey. I'm so happy to have you sharing with us today. My name is Charlotte Banks, and I am the facilitator for this Bible study, and we are studying the book of Acts. So I invite you to join us uh, if we go into prayer right now to begin our Bible study. Father God, it's in the name of your precious Son, Jesus, we come to you again, Lord. And we're grateful, Lord, that we have another opportunity, because it did not have to be so. So thank you, Lord, for giving us this day and this moment, for giving us this time to study. Lord, we want to learn more of you. We want to learn all that it is that you've done, all that you've prepared for us, and how we should respond to it, Lord. So it's all right there in your word, and we thank you. In the book of Acts, Lord, we've uncovered so many things that are wonderful examples for how we in our current day can follow the, the way that the early church did. And so we thank you for that. Be with us and guide us now, Lord. Have the Holy Spirit bring to our remembrance the things that we've learned and prepare our hearts and minds for what is yet to come. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All righty. So we are in the book of Acts, and we are at... Uh, the 23rd chapter and last week uh, we began that portion of it and we made our way down through verse number five uh, but I do want to just kind of set the steam there we had we left off with this discussion of, of this out of character uh, outburst that Paul had had for uh, that's a good way to put it back up in in verse number three and and you recall the scene that he's there standing before the Sanhedrin uh, this is his opportunity to uh, begin his defense he had tried to do it with the crowd out at the steps of the Antonia fortress you recall that back in chapter 22 and that did not go well and so he was taken into custody back with the, the Romans uh, at which point he revealed that he was a Roman citizen. You recall we discussed that at length. And then the commander decided, the Roman commander decided that there was something going on with the Jews and Paul, and it really had something to do with a Jewish law or, or something of that nature. So he felt perhaps the Sanhedrin can get to the bottom of this. Because the Roman commander was going to be responsible for making a report back as to why there was this riot in Jerusalem. That's, that's really what is driving him. He's got to explain why there was this riot, what did he do about it, how was it resolved, and so forth. And he can't seem to, to even find out why it occurred. So that was his motivation for getting the Sanhedrin involved. So. At the time that Paul started uh, going uh, or, or began to make a statement in front of the Sanhedrin, we saw back in, in verse number one that he did not give what was the customary address. We discussed that the customary address would have been fathers and elders of Israel and that type of thing, whereas he just starts out uh, in verse one with my brothers or brethren, some of your translations may say. So he starts out not giving any reverence to the Sanhedrin, uh, but rather putting himself on the same level with them. If, if you're saying my brothers, then we're all equal. And we talked about the high priest Ananias, the, the type of person that he was, and we knew that this particularly offended him. And then we saw that he had Paul struck in the mouth. And we spoke about that last week, how that was more of an insult than an injury. And then Paul gave this, uh, this statement here, in, or the, blurted out this thing in, in verse 3, that really started everything else that is to follow. So uh, we, we spent time talking about that, the words that he used. Um, in fact, let's... Let's just read verse 3. So I'm reading right now from the NIV. This is Acts chapter 23, verse 3. Uh, and this is Paul in response to having been struck in the mouth. And then he's, Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. 
you sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. So we, we spoke about this at length last week, how out of character it was for Paul, how he had never responded in, in all of the things that had happened to him, never responded this way. We also looked at um, a scripture where Jesus used that same expression of whitewashed, and then we looked at how Jesus' response was, nothing at all like what Paul did. And we, we talked about that um, at length last week. Then we looked at verse 4 because the ones who were standing near Paul, the ones who had, had hit him, are then indignant. And they say in verse 4, how dare you insult God's high priest? We talked about that. You know, the high priest Ananias was not hardly God's high priest, especially not the way that, that he was living. We could probably... Uh, do better to call him the, the Roman side priest than to call him God side priest. But then we got down to verse 5. And in verse 5, this is where I had mentioned to you that it was a, a little bit um, of controversy as I was doing my research on how scholars perceived uh, Paul in verse 5. Uh, he says, and Paul replied, Brothers, again, there's that brothers, right? Um, I did not realize that he was the high priest, for it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. So uh, of the, uh, the kind of theories that different uh, scholars think about this particular verse is that in one case they're saying, well, Paul did have poor eyesight. And there are other scriptures that gave an indication that he had poor eyesight. So perhaps... When he's saying, I did not realize that he was the high priest, meaning he couldn't see that well to determine that that was the high priest. We talked about the possibility that Ananias did not have on the usual garb that the high priest wore, but the high priest did not always wear that garb when they were in the Sanhedrin. So uh, there's that. Uh, there was another theory that he responded this way because Ananias was not a true high priest, meaning really coming from the priestly line uh, that as God had set it up in the, in the beginning when he made Aaron a high priest and the, all priests were to come out of that line, that Ananias, as so many before him, had just become political appointees. Uh, so he was not a, a true high priest. And then also a true high priest would never have given such an order that a man be struck as Paul was. And then the other school of thought is that Paul simply was not going to acknowledge Ananias, him personally, as being a high priest under these kinds of circumstances. So those were the, um, the schools of thought. And then I gave my humble feeling of it um, and, and I say that always up front that I am not a, a, a Bible scholar from that perspective I do research things but as I looked at it I really think that this is just sarcasm at its best uh, that Paul is speaking there he quotes a true scripture when he quotes do not speak evil of the ruler of your people but he, it, he is saying that because Ananias nowhere deserves any type of respect or credit. And that he, he knows the scripture, he meaning Paul, knows the scriptures of what really should be done. And he's saying, with, in light of all of this, he is not hardly a high priest. So, and then I said to you last week that you would see in the next verse, meaning verse 6, a little bit more of why I was of the um, opinion that it was really more kind of sarcasm. So uh, let's just look here now at verse number 6. And again, I'm reading, for right now, I'm reading out of the, the NIV. It says, Then Paul, knowing... Some of your translations may say perceiving. 
some may say saw, that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees. And I'm going to stop right there for right now. So I, my thought was, Paul, the Pharisees we know uh, from our past studies in the book of Acts and, and also from some of the scriptures were clearly identified by their garments. So it was easy to pick out someone who was a Pharisee based on what they wore. So it, in, in my mind, Paul seeing or perceiving or knowing that some were one thing was going to discount the the theory that he just didn't see well, that he had poor eyesight. I felt that that really kind of dismissed uh, that part of it. And the, the idea that he is about to do something based on this information is a little bit more of why I felt that um, it was just sarcasm because he is, you know, we've talked before about how shrewd he is. So everything that he discerns, he uses for his advantage to gain, inform to, let me think of, his advantage in, in getting across his viewpoint on what he wants to say about Christ. So Paul is going to take whatever the situation is, so however he is presented, with information or with the situation. He is going to use that. We saw that when he started using uh, the native language of the different groups, when he spoke to the commander in Greek, when he spoke to the crowd outside the barracks in Aramaic. All these different things we saw that he, of him using what he had. He's very, very shrewd. We saw it when he gave certain information. So let's say he told the commander that he was a Jew from Tarsus. And that's all he told him. Whereas he told the crowd that he was a Jew. He was from Tarsus. He had been studied under Gamaliel. You know, more things. So here, he is going to take this knowledge of the audience and he was going to use it uh, to his advantage. So we see here it says that he perceived that some were Sadducees and some were Pharisees. And so I want to talk just a little bit about them. The scripture goes on here to talk about some differences, but I thought I wanted to point out just a little bit more. So both the Sadducees and the Pharisees were religious sects, or we could even call them more of political parties. Because in addition to uh, being religious leaders, they were political leaders as well. So the Sadducees, let's look at them first. The Sadducees were, um, be, because they controlled the temple, they, sort of, they thought of themselves in the high priestly line, but we've seen before that that's not the case. But anyway, they were elitist. They were very arist aristocratic. They were wealthier in general than, say, the Pharisees and others. Uh, and they held more powerful positions, whether it be in the Sanhedrin or whether it just be in uh, the temple or in general as far as leadership of Israel. Uh, they were, they were um, as I said, they were controlled the temple. They were responsible for all of the different priestly functions that took place in the temple. And even though some things had, were no longer going on, like there, uh, the animal slaughter and so forth was no longer going on, there were still a lot of different functions that had to, uh, be, had to take place, and so they were in charge of those. Uh, also, in the Sanhedrin itself, I wanted just to say, that of the different people assembled there, and even of some that were considered chief priests and all, not every, not all of them were Sadducees, but so just a point. So even though they claim to have all the priestly functions and do all those things, not every single priest, whether in the temple or here in the Sanhedrin, was a Sadducee. The majority were, but not necessarily all. They were. Um, as we see in the case of Ananias, more concerned 
with politics than with religion. They were uh, much more concerned with what the Romans thought of them than even what the, the people, even leading the people, the other Jews. Now, here, they rejected oral tradition. We saw when Paul was making his, um, presenting himself to the crowd, he talked about studying under Gamaliel. He talked about understanding uh, the oral traditions under Moses as well as the law. Well, for the Sadducees, if it wasn't written down, it did not exist. They didn't want to hear anything about any oral tradition. Uh, they just rejected it outright. The only source of divine authority had to come from something that was written down. Uh, they insisted on a literal, literal trans uh, interpretation of any scriptures that were presented. They felt that man had total free will. And I'll discuss that a little bit more when I go to how the, the Pharisees and their perspective of free will. But the Sadducees thought that man had total free will. Uh, that the soul, they believed there was a soul, but that it was not immortal. And that there was no afterlife. Uh, they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They did believe in the Jewish concept of Sheol, S-H-E-O-L, Sheol or Hades. It's sometimes represented and this was a place where the soul went after death. It didn't, there was no afterlife, it didn't live on, but it, it went to Sheol. Um, they also felt that there were no rewards and no penalties after death. What, it, what you did and what you got occurred in this life and that was it. Uh, they did not believe in any type of angels or spirit or any spirit world. And uh, then with this set of beliefs, after the temple was destroyed in 70 uh, AD, or some of your trans, even looking at that, you may sometimes see CE, which means current year. But those of us of a certain age always think of BC and AD. Anyway, uh, after the temple was destroyed by the, the Romans, they ceased to exist. The Sadducees simply ceased to exist at all. So that sort of where they were, their belief system, and so forth. Now, the Pharisees, um, on the other hand, where the, the Sadducees claimed or, or tried to claim to be of the high priestly line, the Sadducees were really a, a social movement or a school of thought. That's how they came into to being. And their name, the name Pharisee, means to be separated. Uh, and they were, in fact, a separatist party uh, when things were occurring uh, a couple hundred years before Christ and the different revolts, the Maccabeans and so forth, that the Jews had. They, that's when they came in, into being. Um, they believed that uh, all Jews would adhere to the written law as well as any of the oral laws or what they would like to call the, tr the traditions. And they would like to apply uh, the, the Jewish law, whether written or oral, to mundane everyday activities in their minds to sanctify the everyday world. So things that were happening now, all the commonplace things, somehow or other, they've got to apply some written or oral law to that. Uh, they gave the oral tradition equal weight to the written word. So whereas the Sadducees did not acknowledge the oral tradition at all for the Pharisees, they acknowledged both equally. The written was not more important than the oral. The oral was not more important than the written. Um, now they were considered to be, among historians, outside historians and so forth, they were considered to be the, the most expert and accurate expositories of Jewish law. So if someone needed to figure out the law or understand it better, go ask a Pharisee. And that's why in, in some of the, the um, commentaries you'll see that them referred to as legalists because they were very, very fine-tuned to all the fine points of both the written and the oral law. Now, whereas the 
Sadducees had control of the temple, the Pharisees were pretty much in control of the synagogues. And as you recall, there are many more synagogues. There was one temple in Jerusalem, but in Jerusalem alone there were like 400 synagogues. And we know that there were synagogues in every other city where there was a Jewish population. That's something we have seen on Paul's travels as he's going different places. He always went to the synagogue. So the influence of synagogues was really pretty much controlled by Pharisees. They did believe that the soul uh, was immortal and they believed in the resurrection of the dead. Now they believed that man had free will, but unlike uh, the Sadducees who said man had total free will, the Pharisees believed that man had free will, but God had foreknowledge of all human activities and destiny. So that's the, the difference there. Uh, the Sadducees, I'm sorry, the Pharisees believed that there were rewards and penalties after death for the things that you did in life. They believed in angels and the spirits and the spirit world. They believed all that existed. And the Pharisees continued to exist after the destruction of the temple, and they somewhat transitioned into the role that some rabbis take even even today. So um, it is interesting to note, though, that with this, Jesus had more run-ins with the Pharisees than with the Sadducees. But this goes back to the Pharisees' attention to the oral law. And in fact, in, in Mark 7, verse 8, Jesus says to them, you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. So in them giving uh, equal weight to both, in a sense, they kind of gave a little bit more weight to an oral tradition if it was going to um, serve their needs more so than the written law. But so that Jesus was, the, the Sadducees really didn't have much to or that many run-ins with Jesus as the Pharisees did. So that's just a little bit of uh, background on the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Uh, since Paul, looking out in the Sanhedrin, remember at the very beginning, he sort of kind of gazed about, uh, apprising the situation, who is who and who is where. Um, I think his eyesight was pretty good there. So he discerned that some were Sadducees and some were Pharisees. All right, so continuing on here in, in verse 6. He called out, all right, well, let me start at the beginning. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the, in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, all right, here he is again at this. It's like, are you... Are you going to give it up and give them the, what they want as far as the title, elders and fathers? You know, no. Paul is going to just remain. He was stubborn that way. And they were on equal level with him. There was nothing special about them. No reverence that they were due, so he was just going to, to stay with it. So here he is again. My brothers... I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. All right, I'm going to hold it right there for a moment. So this is now, in a sense, new information. When he had addressed the, the crowd on the steps of the Antonia for Fortress, he had said that he was a Jew, he had studied under Gamaliel, and it was known that Gamaliel was a Pharisee. But Paul, at that point, had not said that he was a Pharisee. So this is the first time we're hearing this from him. And he's not saying, I was a Pharisee. He's saying, I am a Pharisee. So in, in present tense, so like, well, wait, what, what Paul, what, what is going on here? How are you a Pharisee? But what he, he was doing in this is acknowledging that there were beliefs 
within the, the Phar beliefs that the Pharisees held that were consistent with what uh, Christians held. So Christians believe that there's a resurrection from the dead. Christians believe in angels and the spirit world. You know, so none of those things were at odds with what the Christians believe. So he is he is shrewdly, you know, that's my favorite word for this whole series of events. He is shrewdly pulling out things. So he knows what his audience here is. His audience is, is strict Jewish Pharisees right here and now, as well as the Sadducees. So he again is relating to them. We have seen him do that at different points where he relates to uh, his audience. He shows where he is similar and then he also does um, point out uh, where he's different. And we're going to look um, a little bit that it, some of it, there were some Pharisees who in fact did become believers uh, even beyond Paul. So here he says, uh, I am a Pharisee. And then uh, son of, or in some translations, descended from what are Pharisees. So he's stating there that his father, at least, and it might even have gone beyond his father, was a Pharisee. And that helps us understand why he was sent as a child to Jerusalem. Now, before when he was talking about studying under Gamaliel, we, we understood the, the information that he was sent there as a child to further his education. He had been in Tarsus, and to really understand what it meant to be in Jew, you needed to be in Jerusalem. But now we get a, a little bit more detail. You know, he's, it's like he's a little bit of a, an onion peeling back another layer. So we get to see another layer of Paul here. So his father being a Pharisee would want his son to get a better Jewish education, but also a better Pharisaic Jewish education. So why not send him to the master? And that's why he studied under Gamaliel. So that information now we get to see. And that would appeal to the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin because they certainly would be, oh, well, okay. Well, he's a Pharisee. His father before him was a Pharisee. Okay, well, you know, you know they're starting to sway a little bit. You know, this fellow's not so bad in here. And then he continues in this statement here. My, starting in the middle of verse 6. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. So I looked at that and I said, well, all kinds of new stuff is just coming out right here because we have not heard that before. And what we want to know is what were the original charges? That's the thought that came to my mind. What were the original accusations, Paul? You're saying that this is why you're on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead? Well, let's go back and let's just take a look at that. If we go back over to chapter 21, Acts 21, verse 28. Let's just look at that so we can make sure that we have this straight in our, in our minds of what was going on and where it is that this is being said. Okay? So you recall in Acts chapter 21, verse 28, this... Well, let's start at verse 27. You know, he's at the temple. He's going in the temple because he, of the vow he had to take. So when, verse 27 says, When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia, and you recall whenever we see that, we know we're talking about from Ephesus. So some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him. This is when it all started. You remember this now shouting, fellow Israelites, help us. You know I can't pass that by because it's so 
utterly ridiculous that all of them are calling for help against this one guy. Anyway, okay, I'll pull myself back in. Verse 28, shouting, fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere. What an exaggeration. Okay. Teaches everyone everywhere against our people. That was the first thing. Against our law, number two, and this place. That was number three. And then they go on. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. That was number four. That's it. Those were the accusations. He teaches against our people, against our law, against this place, meaning the temple, and he brought Greeks into the temple. Nowhere in those accusations is there anything about the resurrection of the dead. Nothing. Not even a hint towards it. All right? So, that's the first thing. Those are the actual accusations. Then you know Paul wanted to, to defend himself, if he could, and he asked the commander to please let him speak to the crowd so that he could offer his defense. So let's look at chapter 22. And if we go down to verse 21, this is where he had begun his defense. He talked about uh, that he had studied under Gamaliel, uh, all those different <laughs> things he said. Then he began to give his, his uh, testimony, so to speak, of his, of his conversion. He talked about the things that had happened to him on the Damascus Road. Then he talked about uh, Jesus appearing to him and the things that he, uh, Jesus had said to him. Then, in verse 21, as this is Paul speaking now, then the Lord said to me, he's, he's in the temple and he's speaking, uh, or he's recounting that he was in the temple and he's speaking. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Verse 22. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him, he is not fit to live. And, and we, we know what happened after, after that point. Uh, the captain had to rescue him again. So this is what he says as he's giving his defense to uh, the crowd or attempting to give his defense to the crowd. And this is what sets the crowd off. The idea that the Messiah would send someone to the Gentiles. Again, we're, there's nothing mentioned about the resurrection from the dead. So now that we're over here in chapter 23, and let's go back over here, chapter 20, 23, we're down here at verse 6, the end of verse 6 where he says, I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. Well, where does this come from? What? It, it was not presented as an accusation. It was not presented by Paul before. But this is something that he knows. If there of the differences between the Pharisees and of the Sadducees, and you'll notice in a couple verses the text describes a little bit of that. Luke Luke does. This particular one is going to really push the button. Paul had made a determination that things just were not going to go well for him. This inquiry behind the Sanhedrin was really a farce and that nothing good could come out of this and that he was going to disrupt it. This is Charlotte speaking now. But I, I think it's, it's pretty clear that he was going to say something, which, which he does, that was going to disrupt all of the proceedings 
in such a way that it would not be able to continue on. So he makes this statement here. And as I said, this one particular belief the different, of the resurrection of the dead was really going to be the one that would bring or separate them, divide them, I guess is a better way to put it. Now, he had already presented, I am a Pharisee descending from Pharisees. So he's already um, played to them or appealed. And I don't want to say appealed because he wasn't looking to appeal to anyone, but to present information that would cause one of them to move more in his direction. And the Pharisees, therefore, were already sort of thinking of him maybe as not so bad. But now this would cause the Pharisees to pivot somewhat away from Paul, but ag against the Sadducees, because the Sadducees would not be able to tolerate this at all. So the Pharisees were now caught in this little precarious position, because if someone has the same belief system that they have, in fact, is one of them, and is going to suddenly come under attack for what they believe, well, they've got to be on his side. Okay, do you see that? So he, it caused this, this decision, uh, division, I should say, excuse me, division on purpose to, to get this uh, conflict going on in here. Now, the I think that Paul probably also wanted to get the um, well let me put it this way Paul knew he had a certain level of protection the Roman commander was was there because he had convened had ordered the Sanhedrin to be convened and we're going to see in a little bit that he was there and the Roman commander knew that Paul was a Roman citizen now, whether anybody else in the Sanhedrin did know that, I don't know. Because that information only was revealed to the centurion inside the barracks right before they were about to scourge him. You remember that. That's when he said, uh, ask the question of the centurion. We saw that. And then, of course, the centurion had to go and tell the commander. So now the commander has this knowledge that Paul is a Roman citizen. And he has already been publicly humiliated by being put in chains in public, which you're not allowed to do with a Roman citizen. He came this close to being scourged, which certainly is not allowed to be done to a Roman citizen. So the commander here is, is probably beginning to sweat a few bullets because the commander was going to have to report back on why there was this riot in Jerusalem in the first place what caused it, what was going on, and that's why he has taken all these steps up until this point. So, again, Paul knows this. Paul knows the position the commander's in. So Paul knew that he had a relative amount of safety from the Jews because of the, his position vis-a-vis -vis the, the Roman commander. But one more thing that Paul was going to do he was going, uh, because central to his ministry was the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he was going to, be, to begin to get in what he was all about. And then, but the issue with Paul, it was not simply resurrection from the dead, but central to his ministry was the resurrection of Christ from the dead, and that the resurrection of men through Christ and that there was hope for men for eternal life through salvation through Jesus Christ. So it was the resurrection from the dead, yes. Paul says that because that's going to, to get the Pharisee. That's, but that's their, his hook for them. But his central point is going to be that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and the fact that we men have the hope of salvation through the belief 
in Jesus. That's our hope of the resurrection there. So Paul is, is shrewdly, shrewdly building his case. Because everything he says here in verse 6 is new information. It's things that he has not said other places. Remember I said he chooses wisely what he says and to whom he says it. And this is another example of this. And what he had hoped for, meaning causing the division and the, and the problem in the Sanhedrin, came to pass. Now, verse Seven. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. That's what Paul had hoped for, and he got it. And then Luke gives a little bit further clarification in verse 8. Uh, some of your translations may actually even have it in parentheses, but it, it was really... Um, a background thought because Luke says in verse 8 the Sadducees say there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits but the Pharisees believe all these so you see what Luke adds Luke adds not just the resurrection because that's what Paul has said but Luke adds in here neither angels nor spirits so as you're going through this, and I know as I was going through this, it's like, wow, well, well, what, wait a minute, you know, more things are being added that did not exist before. So I'm saying, well, well, Luke, why now, Paul didn't say anything about angels or spirits, why are you putting that in there? And I, what I think is that Luke adds clarification. We have seen that at different points in time through the scripture. And what he adds is the clarification that when Paul spoke of his Damascus Road experience and when he talked about his encounters with Jesus and what Jesus said to him, to, for Luke now to say that the Pharisees believe uh, in angels and spirits and the Sadducees do not is to try to capture that concept. So that when Paul was giving uh, or restating what happened on the uh, Damascus Road, some of the Pharisees, and even some, because that was occurring to the crowd, but some of those in the crowd and even Pharisees could take that as being an angel or a spirit speaking to Paul, not necessarily the risen Christ. So I, I think that Luke put that part in there uh, sort of to explain why that had not been challenged at the time. The only thing that was challenged at the time were the things that set the crowd off, I should put it, was the thought of anything related to the Messiah sending someone to the Gentiles. Okay, so uh, Luke has that. And now what we get is a scene in, in, in total disarray. So if you think of it, and we saw when we looked at the, the, ski, the drawing of the Sanhedrin, and we noticed that everybody is seated except for the accused. And I guess in other cases it might be uh, that there's someone who was making an appeal on the part of the accused. They were the only persons standing. It would, that's the tradition. That's pretty much uh, how it went. And here now we're getting ready to see some movement. So, as I looked at this scene, I thought that up until, um, let's say, right after verse 3, when Paul's lashed at back out, well, no, let me take that back. When Ananias ordered Paul to be struck, in my mind, there probably was a little low-key murmuring, certainly there was silence because pro probably everybody was shocked at what had just taken place of someone being struck right there in the Sanhedrin. Uh, so everybody was probably shocked and then they probably, you know, did, did you see that? You know, just to their neighbor, just kind of little low-key low murmuring. Then when Paul made that statement, 
in verse 3 about the high priest being the whitewashed wall, there was probably a little bit louder going on like, what did he just say? No, did you hear that? Did he really say that? Because certainly as bad as it as, or as surprised as they had, may have been at Ananias having Paul struck, they were shocked beyond, beyond measure at what Paul said. Not only did he just say it out loud, but the words he chose, and then you know, saying, God will smite this, like, oh, no. So, so you can sort of see the tension already building in the crowd. For, for what was going on up until that point. And then as we get further down, and then when Paul is saying what he didn't realize, and they're probably like, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. And then Paul taking it all in and then going in for the, the thing that's going to really cause the uproar to, to take place. The dispute is, is hot and heavy right then and there. And verse 9 says, There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. So things are clearly out of control because they're standing up. Now, I want, I want you to look at one thing that we studied before because this is like um, something that the Pharisees would do. Go back, uh, if you don't mind, to Acts 15. Acts chapter 15. Uh, and th- this is when I was saying that some of the Pharisees would also become believers because the beliefs of the Pharisees were not... Uh, there were many that were shared by the Christians. Let me put it that way. So um, you'll recall this as soon as we get there. This is like the beginning of the Council of Jerusalem. Acts chapter 15, I'm just going to read a couple verses, starting at verse 1. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas, you know, it's the first journey, if we see that, right, into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this this question. Verse 3, the church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything that God had done through them. Key, verse 5. Then some of the believers, see that first, believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. So we see here that there were Pharisees who could become believers and still remain Pharisees, right? But look what they did. Stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. So this was like their power play. In a place where everyone is to remain seated, except the accused, they stood up in the Sanhedrin. But here, back in Acts chapter 15, when the whole matter of the circumcision was being discussed, they stood up. So this was their way. This was, uh, the the Sanhedrin was primarily Sadducees. So the the Pharisees were in the minority there. But this action of standing up would give them the upper hand. So let's go back now to Acts chapter 23. And we're now at verse 9. So you can see the scene, right? First, they were just um, murmuring back and forth of what was going on. Then when it became apparent that Paul was presenting something that was on the side or that the Pharisees could also believe, which was contrary to what the Sadducees could believe, 
then it was going to really now just go on down, devolve. And I can imagine, and I do have a vivid imagination, but I can imagine the beginning of a few insults being hurled across. So not, I'm no longer nudging and talking to the person next to me, because they probably, we're all probably together. More than likely the Pharisees sat together in a certain group. So I'm no longer just sharing my thoughts and my outrage or my shock or whatever it might be with my neighbor, my, my friend, the person like me. I have got to defend our position against them. So I'm probably hurling some type of an insult over to the Sadducees. Sadducees are probably saying, you invent stuff, we stay with the law. And the Pharisees are probably saying, yeah, but you don't even know what the whole law is because you only go with what was written. What happened when they were out in the wilderness? There were no books then. I'm, all right, I'll bring my imagination back in. But you can see what was going on. Uh, they were at each other. Then some of the Pharisees stood up. So now it has gone from a little din, an undercurrent, a little louder noise, because Paul had to shout to get this one in. And if you go back and read that in some of your translations, it explained that he had to speak loud or speak out or shout to make that statement about why he was on trial. So the level of sound, the noise level, had already written. And now some of them were standing up, like we're about to come to blows on this. And we're going to have to stop right here. So we'll pick up on this impending fight next week with it. But we're going to stop right now to uh, make some announcements and to make sure that we are able to close in prayer on that one. So continue on reading uh, this and the rest of the chapter and see what you think. You know, like I've given you my thoughts of how it struck me, but you read those scriptures and see what you think about it. You know, was Paul just had, did he just have a case of uh, poor eyesight? You know, see what you think. Because it is important as you go through, as all of us go through and we study the scriptures, that we understand them and we think about them and we internalize them and take them on. Now, we don't, we don't make what we want it to be. We accept it for what it is. But there are things in, in a situation like this where we have a certain impression. It hits us a certain way. Okay, moving on. So again, I want to thank you for, for joining us today. I want to remind you also that we do live stream our Bible studies on Tuesdays, which is in the book of Psalm, and that's facilitated by our interim pastor, Reverend Sheila Thorpe. This is Wednesday. I'm Charlotte Banks, yours truly, and our worship service is on Sunday at 9 a.m. Now, I would like to inform some of you, but remind others of you, that we, you are invited to join us for in-person worship. The things have changed to the point and precautions have been taken at our facility, at our building in Plainfield, that we invite you to join us for in-person worship. There is um, a registration form because the numbers are limited, but if you submit your registration by going to our website, shilohplainfield.org, and clicking the um, in-person worship button. That may not be exactly what it's called. I can't remember right now. But uh, clicking that button and you fill out the form and submit it, unless you get a call back, and it will be pro pretty close to immediate, unless you get a, a response probably within one day that, that we have reached our number. If you don't get that response, you are included in the number and invited to come. So we want you to come. Uh, you will be, have to be masked up, and there are certain other protocols that need to be followed. They're also available on the website.
but it's really plain and easy stuff. But plan to come and join us in person. Whether you are a member of Shiloh or whether you are one of our virtual members, whether you're just a friend, whatever, come and join us in person. Come and see what it's like at our facility, our building at 515 West 4th Street in Plainfield, New Jersey. I also want to, uh, to let you know that Cyber will be resuming. And for, uh, for a, a lot of our virtual uh, members, Cyber is Shiloh Institute of Biblical Learning and Education. Uh, if you needed something to sort of think of it as, you could think of it as Sunday school, but it is just so much more, so much more. So this is our education arm, and it's going to be resuming, and it's going to be resuming on a virtual platform initially. We realize that we're not able to have all of the different classrooms that we're accustomed to having, but we will begin it on a virtual platform. So in, uh, on the website again, shilohplainfield.org, you will find uh, three buttons that pertain to it. There's a button from a message from Reverend Thorpe on Cybel, and it is an explanation um, uh, to an invitation to come back and an explanation of what it is that we're planning to do for our Cybel classes. Then there's actually a listing of the classes that are being offered for this semester, which is going to begin in October. And then there is a registration form. So what we want you to do is to read the, the letter from Reverend Thorpe, look over the classes, and make a decision of what class you'd like to participate in. Then you, the registration form, you have to actually uh, download it to be able to, to print it. It's not a form that you can complete online. But you really don't even have to do that. If you see the class that you want to attend, you can simply call the church office and say, I want to be enrolled in whatever the class may be. Give your name and your contact information, and uh, then someone will get back to you. The registrations are open, and so we encourage you to do that. We also want to let you, uh, to remind you of our census to complete. If you have not done your census, um, make sure you go to 2020census.gov. We're close to, getting close to the deadline, September 30th. So please, 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 Complete your census, encourage someone else, check on your friends, your neighbors, and so forth, so that we can get our tax dollars. This is not imaginary money. This is money that we have already paid in. Get our tax dollars worth appropriated back to us based on our population. And then I want to talk to you about voter registration. I have talked about this um, a lot, and I will continue to talk about it because it's so important that we vote in November, but in order to vote in November, you must be registered. So we have actually put on our website a button that will link you to the New Jersey Voter Information Portal, and there's a lot of good stuff on there. You can register online to vote, but one of the big things that's going to come uh, when the mail-out ballots are sent in, sent out to us, let me put it that way, you will be able to create an account and track the receipt of your ballot back. So if you uh, vote by mail and either if you send it in by mail or if you put it in one of the secure drop boxes, you'll be able to know that it was received by your county clerk. So um, please check that, that particular site out and uh, pay attention to that and encourage others to as well. So I don't have any particular prayer requests for any individual person, but please continue to pray for all of our members, both our virtual members and our Shiloh members, for all those who might be sick or shut in, all those who are grieving the loss of a loved one. We want to always keep in, in prayer the, our country, all of the issues that we're facing right now with uh, social injustice, the over overwhelming effects of COVID-19, how much it affects our population from a health perspective, from a back-to-school perspective. Uh, keep all of that in your prayers. Please uh, pray for the leadership of our church and that they'll continue to lead us in, until God reveals who our under-shepherd is going to be. Pay, pray for the pulpit search 
team and for all of us. And so let's go right now to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus, Lord, we know that there is no prayer that is ever wasted. And even though it is short, we know that you hear it all. So please, Lord, for our petitions that we have made, hear them, Lord, and help us. Be with us and guide us, Lord. Keep us in your presence. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen.